Um, so for those of you who don't know, um, Blair is the president of our region and uh, he's here to join us to welcome us and uh, open us with a bit of time of reflection. But before we do that, I just want to take a moment to introduce Susan Nienaber. She's um, somebody that has offered leadership over the years in um, in our region and we're so happy to have her back among us again. And uh, she's a former Alvin Institute consultant and uh, she works uh, as district superintendent um, for the, um, uh, sorry, I'm losing my train of thought. <laughs> Easy Methodist in Minnesota. <laughs> Yes, exactly. Thank you. And, uh, and she also does some consultant work and her area of specialty is in is in conflict. And uh, it just seemed to me that now is a good time to have some conversations around conflict because we're all just kind of tired of this pandemic. And I think being tired also means we can be a little crabby and maybe a little short with each other. And so it's a good time to take a step back and um, and reflect on that and to be a little proactive about how we might deal with that. So thank you, uh, Susan, for being here. Also want to welcome Rosemary Lambie. She's one of my executive minister colleagues. Thank you for joining us. And uh, I don't know if any of my other colleagues are online. If you are, just give a shout out. And uh, really appreciate you being with us today. Um, I'm going to invite Blair to open our time with a bit of reflection and just um, as we're doing that, just call into consciousness the folks in Lac Willams who lost their church building this weekend uh, in a fire. I know that you have been uh, probably praying for them over the course of the weekend and it just uh, take a moment to reflect on what they're dealing with um, as they figure out uh, their future and deal with all of the challenges of dealing with insurance and all of those things. So thank you for, for that. So Blair, over to you. Uh, thank you, Trina. I'm, uh, hello everyone. Hello, Susan, I'm happy to, to meet you. I'm glad that you're with us this morning. Um, it's a glorious day in New Westminster where I am. I'm looking out of my office, the sky is blue and the air is crisp and it's hard to believe that the rest of the, the, the continent is, in, is mired in, 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 uh, is in winter. It doesn't feel like winter as I look at my office today. Uh, so I'm, I'm kind of grateful for that. I'm also reflective that I, just as I was coming on uh, to find the, um, to look for the, the, the link to this meeting, I came across the, uh, just a very recent email from the region telling us that George Hermanson has died uh, on, on Groundhog Day. And, and George has been such a influence in his writing has been uh, influential to my own ministry. And so I'm just kind of like, oh my goodness. So I, I'm uh, kind of, I'm, that, that's just kind of landed on me. So I, I just want you to know if I'm stuttering and stumbling, it's like, oh my goodness. Um, I'm interested in the topic because um, I serve in a congregation, I serve in a place that where there has been systemic con conflict for 20 years uh, in, in multiple layers of it. And, and, um, and smarter people than me have attempted to address the challenges. And, um, and so I'm, I'm thinking of a text that Jay Olson shared with us that when she was her was at the time as president, it comes from John's gospel. And it's on my mind this morning. So I'm gonna just uh, share it with you as, um, as you'll remember it, Jesus is praying in the garden the night before, the night he's betrayed. It's the long prayer in John's gospel. And uh, there's this lovely, beautiful section. It's like three verses. I'm not, I'm not praying only for them, but also for those who believe in me because of their word. I, will, I pray they will be one, Father, just as you and me, and just as you are in me, and I'm in you. I pray that they also will be in us so that the world will believe that you sent me. I've given them the glory that you gave me so that they can be one just as you and I are one. 
I'm in them and you are in me so that they will be made perfectly one. Then the world will know that you sent me and that you have loved them just as you loved me. It came, I was thinking about it. Like there's all kinds of words about how to be in conflict with one another in scripture, but that prayer just all of a sudden sailed into me. And I'm also thinking about as we look at each other on these funny little screens, you know, where we're, we're that this is our only kind of contact with each other and we're all over the region. And I'm reminded of the words of uh, Peter Short. Um, as we think about the folks with whom we struggle, uh, I think about his words at a leadership event that he offered behind every pair of eyes is a soul at work and how that helps us to remember our humanity. So that's what's on my mind as we enter into this experience together. I, I commend it to you. I share it with you. I invite you to think about it with me. I invite you to kind of let it settle into your body. What does it mean to be one with the person I'm most <laughs> in conflict with? And behind their eyes is a soul at work. And I invite you to pray with me. I'm reading from a prayer from the Iona community. Let's pray together. You are the love of each living creature, O oh God. You are the warmth of the rising sun. You are the whiteness of the moon at night. You are the life of the growing earth. You are the strength of the waves of the, of the sea. Speak to us this day, O oh God. Speak to us your truth. Dwell in us this day, O oh God. Dwell in us with love. In your holy name we pray. Amen. There you go. Thank you, Blair. We appreciate that. So I think without uh, further ado, I'm going to invite Susan to, to uh, lead us in our time together. And, uh, and then uh, we may have time for a couple of little announcements at the end. Yeah. Thank you. Susan. Well, thanks. Oh, thanks, Trina. It's good to be with you all. And um, I always uh, try to say yes to the United Church of Canada, especially Trina. I'll find <laughs> Trina anywhere. Um, so, um, uh, but it is great to be with you. And it's, it's great to have a few moments uh, to reflect with you on conflict in congregations while we're in the midst of a pandemic and all the other uh, stressors that came with 2020 and now early 2021. In a few moments, I'm going to give you a chance to go into small groups because I'd love to have you reflect on the question of what's different now, what's been different in the last year about stress or tension or conflict um, in your congregation. That's going to be the question I'm going to have you reflect on with each other, and then we'll come back and I'll have you put a few of those reflections um, in the in the chat for us so that we can all see what's um, uh, what's on your mind. I've been working with conflicted congregations now for 27 years. It's hard to imagine. Uh, the, one of the biggest questions that I get is why? Why do? Why would you do that? What's wrong with you? Um, but I'm still. Uh, I still love the work. I still am inspired um, by the miracles that I have the opportunity to see when people are uh, faithful to the spirit at work in their midst and are willing to do the hard work um, to solve complex problems um, in their congregations, as well as to develop new and healthier norms, patterns of behavior and best practices um, as churches. Before you go into small groups, I just, I want to say a couple of things. You know, we all know that conflict is inevitable and um, that really it's an opportunity to grow if we're willing to embrace it. We get ourselves into trouble when we try to avoid conflict, uh, when we use indirect means of communicating with those that we're in conflict with. Um, and, um, but it makes us uncomfortable and it makes us frightened. And so it's very difficult then to roll up our sleeves 
and uh, to want to deal directly with the issues and stay with it long enough um, to be able to get to the other side. But I have noticed that um, the global pandemic has changed things. And um, some of the things that I'm noticing, for example, in my own district that are causing stress and tension were things that were not there before um, under more normal circumstances. And so today, because we're gonna be focusing on uh, conflict in the midst of a pandemic, I'm gonna give you a, a moment here in small groups. And I think, um, Trina, we could do I think we could do something short, like 10 minutes, uh, just to give folks a chance to share with one another, what, what are you noticing that is different about conflict, stress, or tension in your congregations right now? Um, so that's a question I'd like you to reflect on. Why don't we go into small groups for about 10 minutes, and then we'll come back and see what it is that you're noticing that's different. Okay, thank you. So. Um... You'll get a request to go into small groups. You'll have to accept that request. And um, Mauricio is going to send us off there now. Welcome back, everybody. Lovely to see you all fly in. <laughs> I ejected myself by mistake, actually. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's so great to see all your beautiful faces. This is always such a highlight of my week when we gather like this. You always seem to be catching up on your lunch, Trina. Don't they give you time to eat? <laughs> <laughs> nope. No. <laughs> that, the short answer to that is nope. <laughs> Yikes. <laughs> I have to tell you, we sure miss Brenda's goodies at uh, when we're meeting for our um, candidacy board interviews. Oh my gosh, it's not mm -hmm. the same without the chocolate and the Twizzlers and the cookies. <laughs> <laughs> indeed, indeed. <laughs> Susan, are you back? I'm back, yeah. Perfect. Oh, oh, good. Well, uh, thank you, folks. I was uh, deeply appreciative of the group that I uh, got to listen in on. Uh, it was fascinating and really resonated with my experience as well. I'm just going to share a few things that I've been observing, and then I think I'm going to summarize a few themes that I heard in my small group. And then if you have a unique theme that came up in your uh, small group that um, I haven't covered, would you be kind enough to put that in the chat? Because um, I think that would be very interesting to hear um, from others. So one of the things that's been happening uh, most recently for me, and I haven't been consulting on a full-time basis for about six and a half years, but all of a sudden in recent weeks, I have been getting flooded with calls um, for uh, long distance work with congregations. I'm still trying to figure out a little bit about what that's about and why um, kind of suddenly now, I don't know if part of it has to do with being in this midwinter place um, where people are particularly exhausted and kind of hitting a new low. Um, but so I've just most immediately um, have been noticing that. Some of the things that I've been paying attention to as I work with um, my pastors and churches and, uh, and as I consult in the small breakout group, I just think folks are a lot more tired and e exhausted and that their bandwidth um, is just, their just emotional capacities are not as great um, as they normally are. And of course we know in this pandemic that we've got a number of people in our communities that are really struggling with job loss, um, food scarcity, 
um, and are in very uh, vulnerable, grief-stricken, tender kind of places um, in their lives. So I think there's there's a great deal of that um, that's going around, and I'm I'm certainly certainly you feel it too. I certainly notice that my bandwidth, my capacities um, to take on certain things are not as high as they normally are. That could be age too, but I haven't quite sorted that out yet. Um, <laughs> I don't we'll, know we'll blame the pandemic. Yeah, the pandemic. Yeah. We'll blame the pandemic. <laughs> For, now. <laughs> For now. I don't know if you went through this uh, in the United Church of Canada to the extent that um, we did um, here, but because of the political mess that we were in and because our former president was referring to the pan, was minimizing the pandemic and was referring to science as fake news. Um, we did have some congregations that got into enormous conflict about um, online worship versus uh, we need to open up to, in, to do in-person worship um, because this virus isn't really real and um, it's all going to go away. And, um, and so I had a few congregations in my district where this became incredibly heated and this was particularly the first, I would say, six, seven months of the pandemic. By the time we hit the fall and more and more people were beginning to know people who were coming down with the coronavirus and they had their kids and grandkids, um, it quieted down substantially. Um, but we, we had some really major um, uh, conflict around, around some of that. And um, pastors in particular were getting hammered uh, by some people really uh, pretty emotionally beat up. The other thing that I've noticed as a trend that's been uh, different in this pandemic, it's related to the tiredness and the exhaustion and the bandwidth, but both clergy and lay folks have had to work outside their job descriptions. Um, I remember several pastors saying to me, um, you know, I've switched from sort of being a traditional pastor as I understood it into having to develop all these technology skills. And um, I feel like I'm running a film studio now instead of um, a church. And so um, many people, both clergy and lay had to ramp up to different skills um, and uh, learn things that they had not uh, had to know before. Um, I also heard a few um, interesting things. Um, I did hear a little bit of relief initially uh, with the pandemic. Um, people who had been going too fast in their lives were able to slow down a little bit. And I was beginning to hear some positive things like we're having dinner together more as a family. Um, I appreciate the slower pace. I appreciate that I'm not traveling so much. I don't, I'm glad I don't have to commute um, to work. So there were some positive things that were happening. And, um, and I, I did hear some people in churches say, gosh, it's been really nice not to have to be face to face with a couple of the more difficult people in the congregation. It's been nice to get a break from them. Um, which was, uh, I don't think I've ever heard that in my um, 27 years of consulting. What stood out for me from the small group as I was listening to the particular small group talk about was um, that people are being more polite and careful uh, around one another, understanding that everyone is uh, tired and exhausted and has a limited um, uh, bandwidth. Um, it's, a, it's more challenging to try to communicate uh, when you're a congregation that is virtual uh, now, and um, it's hard to know where people are at in some instances, if they're still as committed or connected to the congregation. It's hard to know um, what avenues to use to um, communicate so that you know that what it is that you need to share with your folks is really getting deeply down into the um, layers and uh, to people's attention. One person mentioned that it's been harder to find the conflict, but once they do and they do uncover it, it's more intense because perhaps it's been festering 
um, beneath the surface for a while. Um, many congregations, and I heard this in the small group, have been using, um, have been pulling together care teams to be calling and reaching out to one another. So that has been a blessing, I think, in the middle of the um, pandemic. I'm a big person about how that's the work of the congregation and that we don't hire clergy as hired hands to make all the care calls for us. Um, and so it's been nice to see congregations take charge of that um, in new ways. I think a lot of people have been, have done a miraculous job of managing the technology, but there's also an impatience or brittleness uh, with the technology. I know I got overwhelmed a few months ago. We were doing a bunch of uh, technology changes in my office. And I just, again, didn't have the usual bandwidth and got completely overwhelmed um, with trying to learn all those new things. It's been hard living with the uncertainty um, and also trying to keep up with uh, rapidly changing regulations coming down from um, our government officials about um, how to manage the pandemic. Um, and I think in general, it's always just harder to communicate without body language, um, without being able to observe the kind of the whole person and how it is that they're uh, reacting to things. Um, Trina, I don't know if you've been managing the chat or. Uh, yeah, there's there's quite a quite a lot of chatter going on, and there's uh, a quite a bit of uh, consensus with some of the points that you've already raised. Mm -hmm. um, someone's raising uh, the fact that that different levels of anxiety and risk tolerance among staff and and I think also lay people um, is is one source of stress. So I don't know if you want to comment about that. Yeah, you know, I'm um, I'm a I'm a big believer in knowing what the distress tolerance is of your congregation because each congregation has a a different level of distress tolerance. Just as different people have a, a different level of distress tolerance um, in their life, and um, I do think that that has shifted and has been impacted. Um, in the midst of the um, pandemic. And so I, I would agree that I think anxiety and reactivity has, has changed and has been different. Um, the one other thing I was going to mention, and then I'm curious about what's all, what else is in the chat, um, Trina. One thing I, I've noticed across our region of 321 or so congregations is that those congregations that were really struggling prior to the pandemic, either with a lot of conflict or with just their own viability, um, seem to struggle a lot harder once the pandemic set in. Um, I also noticed that congregations that were doing well or were at least solidly stable, um, uh, have done have done well, have remained stable um, in the pandemic, or those congregations that were doing better than just being stable. I've seen some incredibly inspiring um, creativity and adaptation that has come from those um, congregations. So I think that's that's been interesting to observe that as well. I would uh, say <clears throat> that that's the case uh, in Pacific Mountain region as well. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's that's pretty consistent with what I'm seeing. I've been very um, impressed with the resiliency of of the leaders and communities of faith all in all. And I also agree that where there were struggles or viability questions, that those have been definitely brought to the forefront even more by this by mm -hmm. this uh, pandemic. Um, there's another comment about the fact that it that it's harder to actually engage conflict when it happens when you can't gather and the challenge around you know having to do that over zoom and also I, I added that it gets exacerbated when some of those conversations are happening by email or you know text um, and and how the subtle nuances of, of those things get lost so I wonder if you want to yeah. comment about that. Well, years ago, years ago, Trina probably remembers this. Years ago, I wrote an article on how email is not a conflict resolution tool. Um, yep. 
that conflict uh, escalation tool. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, but it generally doesn't work very well. And I found that to be the case too. I know that um, late this fall, I had a church that was struggling with uh, the whole issue of in-person worship versus uh, being on online. Uh, and uh, there were some people that were becoming quite agitated that they weren't in person. And so the weather was still good enough that I was able to gather people together outside um, to have a couple of meetings. Um, but we were right on that edge of really cold weather starting to set in. And so it, it did make it much more challenging. Um, we still did a couple of meetings where we opened up the windows in the fellowship hall and everybody spaced themselves and we had um, masks, but it was, um, it, it was definitely harder. And um, uh, yeah, so that, that has definitely been challenging. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And, and uh, somebody else commented about that it, that it also makes it easier just to avoid conflict mm -hmm. um, because you don't have to come face to face with the person. Yep. Yep. Yeah. I think that's true. And it, it's going to be interesting to see how uh, just worship in general changes after the pandemic. Um, I think there are some people in some of our congregations that have discovered that they really prefer online worship. And, um, and so we may just not see some folks. And so the adaptation that it will be required um, to keep people connected um, in that manner as well. Um, yeah, some people like a cup of coffee in their jammies uh, to be in worship. And so it'll be difficult for them uh, to come back out. So, yeah. Yeah, the congregation where I worship does Zoom coffee after church, but I can't go because I'm usually in my pajamas. <laughs> <laughs> right. um, the uh, others indicated that where there was conflict, uh, Diane Stewart says, where there was conflict happening before COVID, it has been exasperated because folks can't get together to talk about that. So I think that's just more uh, affirmation of what we've been talking about. Right. Um, Blair says the pandemic has also exposed the deep fault lines and patterns and level of passion and commitment. Yes. Oh, I think that's I think that's very true. I've used the word fault lines for a lot of years to describe those kind of natural, usually not problematic um, uh, divisions in congregations, whether it's um, between groups that attend different services, or it may be uh, a merged congregation where there are still people that were a part of, of those previous con uh, congregations. I think there's always some degree of fault lines in um, congregations. And most of the time our churches manage those fault lines pretty well. But whenever tension and stress gets too high in a congregation, things are gonna break along those fault lines. So it will likely escalate um, around that. And it is much more challenging in the pandemic to sort through more complex uh, problems. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I find sometimes it, it, the problem even gets made bigger because of, of the email and, and the lack of being able to gather than it actually is or would be if you were able to just be face to face and in conversation with people. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we haven't had as much conflict around whether to worship or not because we've been pretty conservative in our recommendations as a denomination and have really encouraged people not to um, not to worship in person. So um, Valerie's saying that that people can blame me <laughs> and Dr. Henry, which uh, which is true. And I, I think it it does. Uh, I hope anyway. Our goal was to to take some of the pressure off the local congregations uh, around some of those conflicts, so that it, yeah. you know you can the the denomination can take the hit um, or or the anger. But also, I haven't I haven't felt a lot of pushback around that because I think people just know that it isn't safe, and so we're not doing that. Um, we had uh, in my other region, we had a, a congregation right at the beginning of the pandemic have an outbreak and had two deaths. So we know the cost um, of taking the risk. Article about that church. 
that yeah. already made it um, to Minnesota. Yeah, and we set a very conservative tone um, as well and um, took the high road and really encouraged uh, our churches. But I think because unfortunately our political situation and our political election, our presidential election was coming up, it, it really was uh, heating up um, late summer and early fall. So. Yeah. Um, so one of the areas of tension that, that is being highlighted is around um, the people that can't participate online because they don't have the capacity for technology Yes, that's been really hard. And, and I think that's been one of the more heartbreaking things, I think, for members of congregations when they know that um, people who are beloved in that congregation just do, cannot master uh, the technology. I've had a couple of my churches, these have been somewhat larger congregations that finally decided as a way to address that, that they would um, allow these folks who were really struggling with the technology to come while they were recording uh, the service, if they were not editing uh, the service, but doing it all in uh, kind of a single live stream. And they were able to take enough precautions to keep people safe. And we've not had any kind of outbreak of COVID, but it did allow a small number of folks to be able to come into the sanctuary, stay safe, um, have um, a little bit of that experience. And that seemed to ease some of the pain, both for members of the church that were worried about them and for those who just couldn't master uh, the technology. But I've also seen some lovely things happen where um, people have really gone out of their way to make sure that they're helping folks um, get, be able to use the technology. So bringing them an iPad with everything loaded. So they just had to push one uh, button. And so it's, it has been lovely to see the amount of um, care that has uh, happened in our congregations for more, our more vulnerable folks. Thank you, yeah. Do you have any pointers for congregations that are either experiencing new conflict or in particular addressing existing conflict um, that, that is now um, moved into pandemic times? Yeah, that's tough. And, and there isn't kind of a one size fits all answer to that. It depends a lot on what the conflict was or is. And, um, We've talked in the past when I've done trainings with the United Church of Canada about the levels of conflict. And um, when conflict gets really high and it's gotten into the level of a major power struggle among, between people in the congregation or it's got, gotten into warring factions or well-defined camps or it's even gotten more destructive than that. Usually when you get to these higher levels of conflict, you're gonna need some outside intervention, um, either through denominational uh, leadership or a consultant or a mediator, or um, because those are, even under the best of circumstances, um, those are really, really difficult um, to try to uh, manage and to try to handle. I think another thing that's very difficult to manage and you do need outside intervention is when there's a great deal of conflict regarding the leadership of the pastor. Um, and almost always the denomination needs to get involved in those kinds of situations. If, if it's less severe um, and it's a complicated problem that has to be solved or, um, um, a miscommunication uh, between people who got really upset with one another. Um, I think we just have to keep at it. We have to keep the door open to keep the conversations going, to keep um, walking, plowing through that swamp. Um, I just don't know that there's an alternative other than taking um, uh, indirect communication and making that more 
uh, direct. Trina, I think I'll use the whiteboard um, for yep. just a second. I have um, I have an old uh, diagram that I've used over the years, and some of you I know, if you've been in trainings with me, you've you've seen this. And um, but it's a simple way to kind of diagram how um, conflict unfolds. And I'm going to be using my little pen here, which works really well on my <laughs> computer, um, to draw this out. But you know, in my experience, conflict almost always unfolds in exactly the same way. If you have two people, person A and person B, and they have conflict with each other, this is my symbol for conflict. One of the first things that's going to happen when two people can't uh, solve this problem that's developed between the two of them, um, they're going to start to put distance in their relationship. They're either going to stop talking altogether or they're going to st stop talking about the issue uh, that they can't get resolved. And when that happens, um, it creates this gulf or this space um, between them. And unfortunately, this space now that's been created because they're pulling away from one another because of the conflict, that's going to get filled with all kinds of uh, negativity. And um, it's going to be filled with negative beliefs, interpretations, assumptions, conclusions about the other person. I often say that I, I never go into a conflict between two people where person A tells me how lovely person B is and how right they are about all the issues. Instead, I get all of this negativity, um, these negative beliefs about how they're wrong um, and uh, whatnot. So really the task of managing, I, I'm convinced over the years, the task of managing any kind of conflict is to keep it contained um, between these two people and to help them to continue to do the hard work of figuring out a way to get past this. Now, unfortunately in congregations, there's this temptation to start to, the technical term is triangulate other people um, into the conflict. So person B will go and speak to person C um, who's a member of the church and A now has gone and spoken with person D who's also a member of the church. And then D will just kind of casually gossip to E that um, they're aware of this conflict going on. And now you have an uncontained conflict and this is gonna start spreading through uh, the congregation. And the more escalated it gets, um, that's when you begin to see the formation of these sides. And when you get to that point, you know, the thinking becomes very uh, rigid and people start to take these kind of hard stances. Um, and um, I'm gonna go ahead and stop the share at that point. And, um, and then it, it just becomes much more difficult to unwind um, the conflict. You often still have to, my experience is you often still have to go back to person A and person B to sort through those um, issues. But if we can keep people talking, keep people connected and keep the conflict contained um, in appropriate channels, uh, we do a lot better. It's when it really starts to spread and you get the gossip and the rumors and the misinformation um, that then, then we have a much bigger problem uh, in the congregation. Yeah. Thank you. That's uh, that's a really good good diagram and, and reminder. I really appreciate that. Um, we've got got quite a few questions in here. Yeah, I'm, I'm not yeah. gonna I'm not gonna refer to the comments. So I'm just assuming that sure. the comments are for each other to read there. But um, when, when, uh well, I guess it's kind of a comment and a question both um, that when there's like growth and development questions that a community of faith has to get at and but are potentially, uh, you know, have conflict associated with them. Um, one example that was in the chat was about pews. Um, 
you know, that, that people struggle to muster the energy to actually have those conversations virtually. And so there's a certain amount of putting things off. Yeah. Um, you know, let's deal with that after the pandemic. Let's deal with that after the pandemic. Do you have any comments about that? Yeah, I, you know, that's, I think that's a really tricky judgment call um, for clergy and lay leadership together to try to figure out you know, what legitimately are some things that we need to wait until we can be back in person? And what are some things that if we do wait that long are gonna get worse um, or gonna be much more difficult for, for us to solve um, as a community? Um, you know, when I hear things like um, pews or when I hear language like growth and development, I do think that one of the things that we can be doing in our congregations right now and this is amenable to Zoom and to other technologies. Um, I'm convinced that a major source of conflict in congregations is when that congregation has lost sight of its purpose. It doesn't understand who it is and what it's called to do and be in that community. And so what happens when we've lost sight of a congregation's purpose, the congregation's gonna drift into focusing on individuals preferences. And um, then we become a consumer oriented organization like a fast food uh, restaurant. Um, and we start automatically trying to keep people happy and trying to cater um, to what people like and want, as opposed to being clearly focused on what we understand to be our mission and purpose and aligning everybody in the congregation to that mission and purpose and to that direction. Um, so if there, are, if there are issues in a congregation that are, have to do with likes and dislikes and preferences um, for members, I do think this time of pandemic and working remotely could be a time to drop back to clarify purpose um, and to make sure that you're working on that alignment. Um, that will make things easier eventually um, when you're able to get back together. Okay, I'm just gonna take that last little statement. I'm gonna clip it and I'm gonna broadcast it all over Facebook and our website <laughs> and everywhere else because that is just yeah. absolutely brilliant and it's, it's worth having you here for the hour. Um, thank you for saying that because I just think that's so important mm -hmm. to what we're about right now. And um, so, uh, so thanks for that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. There's a wondering as to whether or not um, the style of worship that people are offering has been been a source of conflict. So doing Zoom versus pre-recorded versus live. Um, ha have you noticed any differences around that yourself? You know, it's been interesting. I think what I've observed in my own congregations, I have 57 congregations that I oversee, um, is that a lot of the quality of the online worship has to do with the congregation's capacities. Exactly. Um, and some of our congregations just, they do not have the capacity to do um, an editing uh, job and to um, splice together lots of different interesting things and then put it on YouTube or some other platform. They've had to uh, sort of stick with what they've been doing before, but do the live stream on Facebook or uh, some other platform. So I think it's been one of capacity. And what I noticed about a, one of my smaller churches that was getting into conflict about in-person worship versus online is that the the older folks in the congregation did not understand the technology well enough to know what it takes to do an edited, a polished edited um, version of a congregation. So they didn't understand why their little congregation that had no technology capacities couldn't be do, doing something as interesting as the neighboring large uh, congregation. And um, so I think that was causing some conflict because people just didn't, didn't have enough capacity to understand the technology in general. Um, so it's been, a, 
It's been a mixed bag, I think. Um, I don't know, Trina, if you folks have been doing this, but we've, we've gotten requests from our churches for us to put together um, some worship services. So I've participated in providing segments to that. And then we have some people on staff that, that, that can do that editing. And we've gotten very positive responses from our congregations, in part because it's just been a relief to the pastor and the people who are managing the technology to get a Sunday or two off um, without having to um, manage all that. And I know it takes our staff inside the conference an enormous amount of time to do that editing. Um, and we've had some churches that have the capacities to farm that out and to pay someone to do that level of editing. But I think people just don't realize how much it takes um, to pull that off. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, we haven't been doing that, but uh, I'm sure you've put an idea in some people's heads now. <laughs> I did more work for you. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I think this is a, a, a good question. We don't want to lose. I know we're close to our time, but um, when a congregation has gone through a serious conflict and then and people have left, mm -hmm. um, do you recommend working to reach out to those who have left, and for how long? Yeah, that's an excellent question. And that's actually a question that I get a lot um, in congregations that are in the aftermath of a uh, high level of conflict. You know, I think I, I usually say several things to a congregation. Um, one is when you get to a really high level of conflict, you're going to lose some people. It's inevitable. Um, it's sad, but it's going to be inevitable. And so I think the, the, the question though is, have we lost those folks for good? Are they just pulling back temporarily until things cool down and some things get settled and they'll be back? Or the minister leaves. Or the minister leaves. Um, or have we, um, or do we have some people that have become de-churched and have maybe lost their faith? I think it's worth it for a group of the right folks in the congregation that have some solid skills, interpersonal skills. I think it's worth it to reach out uh, to folks. Um, now, I wouldn't get into a position of begging people who've made a clear decision that we're out of here and we're never coming back. I don't think that's productive time and I think that can, can become disrespectful of people's uh, decisions and wishes and desires. But I'm always surprised at the number of people who eventually come back. Um, but I also think it's a little dangerous when people pull away from a church in conflict and then come back later, because if they haven't been there for the work and the growth, they're gonna come back to a different congregation. And we do know that people who emotionally cut off when, it, when the conflict is high, they can stay emotionally stuck at that place where they cut off. And so it may be very difficult for them to come back and they may have to do some work with the therapist or someone outside uh, the system to help them uh, deal with the hurt and the trauma that they've experienced. But I think initially within the first probably six months, I think it's a good idea to reach out because I think people who are remaining in the congregation to continue to work through these issues are also going to learn some interesting things um, by reaching out to others. But I think we have to do it in a way that um, is, is not being disrespectful or hounding or bullying people who've made a clear decision to leave. Thank you. Yeah. So we're, we're kind of at our our time, but um, if anybody has a really pressing question that I've missed, um, if if you could uh, if you could um, either put a note or raise your hand, um, virtually raising your hand, I can't see all your faces. Let me know. Um, <clears throat> it's been a very rich time and a really rich conversation. I think it's very very helpful. Um, <clears throat> there are some some good comments, so if you want to save the chat and scroll through them later. Uh, there's lots of interesting things in there. Um, Bethan has just uh, made a note that it would be nice to receive a, a worship service um, uh, once a month that people can use. I just want to highlight the, as part of our church plant uh, ministry, 
Um, we actually, as a region, sponsor the um, the United Online Ministry. Andrea Irwin out of Highlands is the is the online minister there. And so we actually do refer people to that as a sort of regional offering that folks um, can access if they need to. So I, I made a bit of a joke about, about uh, creating more work for myself, but, but in reality, we do have something that we offer people that way. So if you've got questions around how you as a congregation could take advantage of that, reach out to Andrea Irwin um, and, uh, and she'll be happy to, to talk to you about how you can engage that and, and perhaps live stream it, stream it to your own community of faith or, or so on. So that's, that's an option for everybody and one that we're already putting quite a bit of resource into. So we do want people to take advantage and we're having some conversations with, um, with Andrea and the Highlands United Church who are sponsoring that ministry about how we can actually grow that into being more, even more of a regional initiative so that it doesn't just feel like it's you going to Highlands worship, um, but but actually it being more of, a, of an actual regional thing. So those conversations are happening, but in the meantime, do know that, 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 that that's there and available for you. I might say one final thing quickly, Trina. Please, yeah. Um, you know, I've also been telling people take advantage of this pandemic um, because um, it has forced major change on our congregations. And I think if leaders are strategic, they can take advantage of the fact that all the eggs got thrown up into the air and um, go ahead and make some necessary changes because people are expecting um, dramatic change. You have to do that carefully and strategically, but there's also some opportunity embedded in all this. Thank you, Susan. Yes, I agree. There's many, many gifts in this pandemic time, and uh, and that is definitely definitely one of them. And another one of them has been having you with us today. So thank you so much. Thank you. Um, we really appreciate the wisdom that you offer, and and we'll probably be talking about you doing more with us in the future. So. Uh, thank you. We always appreciate your leadership and uh, the opportunity to be with you. And just a couple of little regional announcements for you. Um, in in two weeks, our town hall is going to focus on our uh, affirming ministry. You will remember that we uh, voted as a region to begin to explore the process of becoming an affirming region. And so um, the sub uh, subcommittee of executive um, has been working on this and uh, and we have a contract with Pam Rocker of Affirm Ministries in uh, St. Andrew's Regional Ministry in Calgary. And she's leading our process. And so she will be leading the town hall in two weeks and uh, really, really encourage you to come and be part of that conversation. We started that a bit at our last regional meeting and this is just the next iteration. And also to highlight the queer virtue um, Lenten study that the Affirm group is sponsoring is based on this book. Um, and uh, it, it's uh, really going to be a great opportunity. It's not your traditional Lenten study, but it's a it's a Lenten study that that I think uh, will be a great opportunity for folks to engage with and learn from, and also just to inform our relationship with this affirming process as we go forward. Some of you were also asking about um, what's happening with the consultation we did on uh, the Justice Ministry and uh, our executive met yesterday and uh, received the report and I will be sharing that report with the uh, region um, in the next day or two and uh, also um, moving toward hiring a half-time position to support the recommendations in that report. Um, that position is funded through an endowed fund from the uh, closure of Capilano United and we feel that uh, it was designated for justice ministry and I'm really excited about the directions that this that this uh, report is leading us in and uh, feeling excited about being able to animate that ministry a little bit more going forward. So I will hang around for a little bit. If folks have some questions, I'll, I'll hang around and answer them for you individually. But officially, we will close our time together and invite uh, Blair to lead us in a closing prayer. I thought I was all unmuted and I wasn't. And there you go. 
Uh, Susan, thank you so much. Uh, it was lovely to hear Trina invite you to come and do more work with us when we've heard you say you would not say no. So that's kind of, <laughs> that's kind of cool. Um, so, you. <laughs> that's great. Happy to hear that. Um, I'm happy to tell you, and uh, I know that Trina is going to send a, a note about this, but the, the region is going to be meeting in June. You'll watch for a notice from the, the office that we will have a regional gathering, uh, a regional meeting uh, in June. Watch for that coming from the office. I'm excited about that. So I just kind of, I might have jumped the gun. And I might hear nope. from Trina That's later. That's good. But... <laughs> no, no, not at all. I, I intended to say it and I forgot. So thank you. So the date is the, uh, the Friday, Saturday, June the 11th and 12th is the, is the regional meeting. That and we'll have theme speakers and music and worship and uh, we'll continue the work that we began in the fall. So mark your calendars for that. It will be online, no confusion. We will do it again in the Zoom format that we did before or perhaps Whova, but we'll, we'll do it on online. So prepare for that. Behind every pair of eyes, hey, look at us staring in, each of us leaning in, each of us wondering you know, we, we have the memory of our relationships with each other, uh, you know, from the times that we do know each other's body language and our memory reminds us of that. For some of us where we've never met only in this format, we don't have that. We have our eyes and uh, behind every pair of eyes is a soul at work. And, um, and I'm delighted to be working in this region with all of you. I think we've been gifted with an amazing tradition that's ours to offer the world in vibrant uh, gratitude and celebration because it does actually change the world. And um, that's what inspires me. So I send you off for this blessing, this closing prayer blessing coming again from the Celtic tradition. May the grace of the love of the stars be yours. May the grace of the love of the winds be yours. May the grace of the love of the waters be yours. In the name of the word of life, may your heart be filled and may you find joy and peace in these days ahead. Amen. Thank you, Blair. That was beautiful. See you all in a couple of weeks. And uh, we... Uh, we really appreciate seeing you all here and uh, wish you well. And please just reach out to us in the region, either myself or the regional minister or Blair, as you need to. We are here to support your work and your ministry. And um, yeah, I'll hang around if you have any questions. Um, I will too, Trina. Yeah. Thanks again, Susan.